Hello everyone, and here are the headlines this evening. On day 32 of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, residents of Mariupol fleeing the war in Ukraine say they are being forced into Russian-held territory in Ukraine or to go to Russia. French President Emmanuel Macron warns that the verbal escalation of the war in Ukraine following U.S. President Joe Biden's comments are calling Putin a butcher and that he should not be allowed to remain in power. Plus, President Putin thanks the country's National Guard taking part in its special operation in Ukraine. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining me today. I'm Amarachi Ubani in Lagos, bringing you our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And let me fill you in on the most recent developments. We're getting reports of residents of the besieged city of Mariupol have been given no option but to leave for Russian-held parts of Ukraine or in Russia itself. As some even say, they were being forcibly evacuated from Mariupol. Let's remember, this is a city that had been bombarded by Russian missiles over the last few days, and where humanitarian corridors have failed. Thousands have been forced to flee as water and electricity supplies are cut off. Meanwhile, Ukrainian military intelligence chief uh, Krylo Bodanyov warns that Russia is trying to apply what he calls the Korean scenario to Ukraine after failing to take the capital and oppose the government. He told the BBC that President Vladimir Putin's priorities are the east and the south of Ukraine after his offensive largely stalled. If he's able to connect the territory, Putin would try to foist a demarcation line separating that area from the rest of Ukraine, just like after the Korean War. And the Canadian government says it can provide more oil, gas and uranium to help solve the global energy crisis. A price is absurd as a result of Russian supplies being squeezed in the wake of the invasion of Ukraine. Canada's Natural Resources Minister Jonathan Wilkinson says many countries are committed to helping as much as they can in terms of displacing Russian oil and gas. Canada is the world's fourth biggest oil producer and has committed to exporting an extra 200,000 barrels of oil. Here's more of day 32 of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Day 32 of the Russian invasion of Ukraine begins with a continuation of the attack on the western city of Lviv on Saturday. Mayor of the city says a facility storing fuel has been burning after rocket strikes on the city's outskirts. Five people were wounded by the strikes after local authorities told residents to seek shelter in the wake of the blast. Lviv Governor Maxim Kozinski later said four rockets hit the city in the most significant attack on the city since the start of the war. The rockets fell as U.S. President Joe Biden, speaking during a visit to Warsaw, Poland, condemned Russian aggression and assured Ukraine of the United States' unwavering support. He says NATO was a defensive security alliance which never sought Russia's demise, adding that Ukrainians are on the front lines in the fight for democratic principles, and that the invasion was a strategic failure for Russia, but that nevertheless a challenge to the rules-based international order which threatened to return Europe to decades of war. It's nothing less than a direct challenge to the rule-based international order established since the end of World War II, and it threatens to return to decades of war that ravaged Europe before the international rule-based order was put in place. We can not go back to that. We cannot. The gravity of the threat is why the response of the West has been so swift and so powerful and so unified, unprecedented and overwhelming. In his speech delivered at Warsaw's royal castle before hundreds of Polish elected officials, students and U.S. embassy staff holding Ukrainian flags, President Biden said his country stands with Ukraine in its fight against the Russian invasion. On Sunday, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says the United States does not have a strategy for regime change in Russia. He was responding to questions regarding an earlier statement by President Biden that President Vladimir Putin will not remain long in power. Uh, with regard to um, uh, the president's incredibly uh, powerful speech uh, yesterday, um, I think uh, the president, the White House, uh, made the point last night that, quite simply, uh, President Putin cannot be empowered to wage war uh, or engage in aggression uh, against Ukraine uh, or anyone else. 
as you know, and as you've heard us say repeatedly, we do not have a, a strategy of regime change in Russia or anywhere else for that matter. Uh, in this case, as in any case, it's up to the people of the country in question. It's up to uh, the Russian people. But what we do have is a strategy to strongly support uh, Ukraine. We've been doing that um, and rallying partners and allies around the world uh, to do that. In the meantime, the Russian Ministry of Defense says the Russian army has launched several rounds of high-precision weapon attacks on multiple targets across Ukraine. The Russian Defense Ministry released footage of assaults where high-precision weapons were used on Saturday, as it says Russian troops have struck 117 military facilities across Ukraine. Let's talk to Miller now, one of the Ukrainians we've been in touch with. Since this war began, Miller is choosing to remain in Venezia, Ukraine, and she hopes this war ends soon. She's requested we only refer to her by her first name. Miller, thanks for joining us on the program. Hi, Marachi. It's great to see you after many days. And one of the few times we have spoken to you, you've mentioned that your parents are safe. Are they still safe where they are? Uh, yes, they're safe, but their hometown was uh, two days ago attacked uh, with a lot of missiles. I can't say their like their name of the hometown town because currently we're trying to do not like uh, tell anyone the information about their targets and other stuff uh, by obvious reason because a lot of uh, Russians military uh, trying to correct the fire and destroy our infrastructure totally. So, uh, yeah, they are safe now. And thanks God that they're like left uh, their hometown uh, recently. Uh, but this is terrible because a lot of my friends are still there, a, a lot of relatives and the infrastructure are totally destroyed. And you've seen more attacks now on Lviv, and that's where you pulled out of, I think, eventually um, Lviv, and then Kyiv also receiving, you know, some bombardments, and now the focus is on Mariupol, uh, which has been bombarded by Russian troops in the past few days. What are your thoughts as regards, you know, what the Russian troops or what the Russian government hopes to achieve in Ukraine? Uh, sorry, the connection not really good. Can you repeat, please? I don't really hear you well. When you, when you hear about the destructions and the targets that are going on uh, that the Russian troops and the Russian military has carried out in cities like Lviv and Kyiv uh, and the capital, and now even Mariupol, which has been bombarded in the last few days, what do you think is the Russian president's goal in Ukraine? Uh, still, again, connection is really bad. I don't know. I don't hear you well. Sorry. Well, um, Mila, we're hoping that you can hear us uh, a bit more clearly, but let's uh, move on, perhaps, to tell us, you know, what's even happening in your own city of Venezia. Like, a few days ago, we still had, like, a lot of attacks, but last two days, uh, Russia attacked Ukraine with uh, more than 70 missiles uh, from Black Sea, from Belarus side, and we had a lot of uh, alarms there. And uh, we had also electric electricity drop and uh, internet connection lost, like, for the last uh, week. Um, so the situation is like that, and I don't see any improvements, and this is re really pity. I'm supposing you're in a bunker right now, uh, Mila, and, and I just wanted to ask, you know, how safe it is where you are, because there have been reports, you know, uh, in Mariupol, there were two attacks on, on people taking refuge at, you know, certain places, a theatre and then an art school. I believe they were also in bunkers. Do you really feel safe where you are? Uh, you know, it's difficult to say uh, where is the safest place in Ukraine, because they are... Russians attack us very, uh, like, not in logical way, maybe it's a logical way, but uh, they attack everything. And uh, regarding Mariupol, as far as I know, because so many friends uh, I, I know about uh, who, who, who live in there, who left there, uh, there, 
they didn't have any like a building which is like still uh, exist so they destroy absolutely all infrastructure they just like swept out the city from the map but i don't know because the internet connection also does not exist there so yeah it's like that well when you when you hear about you know the number of people who've died in this war so far you know and the russian military and the russian forces and airstrikes targeting you know civilian populations, you really think that the people are the target or it is military infrastructure, as Russia says? Um, no, they are not targeting only military infrastructure. They are targeting civilians' buildings and civilians' places. Like, theater is not military-like object. It's like theater, for example, in Mariupol, which was destroyed by Russians. It's like, like civilian objects, like... Uh, hospitals are not like uh, military objects. They are also destroyed hospitals and uh, schools and uh, other like civilian buildings where people live. So it's like that. They target everything. And you've been in hiding for more than two weeks, Miller, and that's um, just almost at the same time, you know, that this um, fighting, this war in Ukraine uh, uh, started uh, shortly after was when you moved. Now that everywhere seems to be under, you know, the target of the Russian troops, how are you doing with, you know, welfare, food supplies and everything else that you're supposed to get, electricity, as well as uh, the internet? Uh, as I told you, like, last week we had, like, few drops of electricity and few drops uh, of internet connections. And also, like, right now, internet connection not really stable. Uh, just because probably in some places where the main infrastructure is located, some fighting is going on. And about food supply, uh, last few weeks it was, was not that good, but now uh, some products again appear in supermarkets, Are you especially still in my region. Yeah. I don't know about the rest of the cities, like I heard that in Kyiv it's still hard, uh there is some limitation but uh, like from yesterday in our region it's okay again with food and we're thankful for that uh, miller are you still hopeful of this war ending anytime soon i really hope uh, because you know uh it's our country, it's our identity i don't know why like russian people wants like to take uh our identification, our like nationality and remove it from, from history, from everything. So like people in Ukraine will not uh, allow Russia to do this. They will like fight until their last moment. And I hope we will win this because it's not uh, about money. It's not about economic, it's about our like nationality. It's like, we are Ukrainian, we have like our own language, our own tradition, our country, and someone from our neighbors wants to just take this uh, like Hitler in, in, in World War, you know, it's, it's terrible. So people will fight until the last moment, and I really believe that we, we will win this, because it's not, it, it's something very like personal. It, it's about all of us, about every like person in Ukraine. It's and very the... difficult. We need like uh, uh, someone to help us to close our sky because missiles like at attack us very like drastically. But but we will fight until the last moment, until the end, and I hope we will win. I pray for for this, and I hope that everything will be fine. Not, not sure that it will be soon, but I really hope the situation will be stabilized and we will still have Ukraine as a country and with people, with nice people who are living here. Are you still hopeful of going back, you know, to where you lived before this war began in Ukraine? Or what do you think is left of, uh, you know, the city that you once resided in? Can you repeat, please? Are you still hopeful of going back to where you were before the war began? 
And what do you think is waiting, you know, there? What will be left of the city by the time you, you return? You know, it's my homeland. And uh, any place where I move, it's, it's not my, like, native country, not like people with who I live. So I really hope to come back uh, again to my place, to my apartment, and I hope it will survive uh, together with all people who I know, with my friends. And uh, I, I, I really like pray for this, and I want that that it, it's happening very soon. Mela, your safety is of utmost priority to us. Thank you for speaking with us. Thank you, and have a great evening, everyone, and, you, and peaceful. And and you stay safe, of course. Now on the humanitarian efforts, the International Committee of the Red Cross says it has delivered over 60 tons of humanitarian aid to the city of Kharkiv. A convoy carrying food and relief items was filmed driving along an empty highway, some with flags hanging from them, others emblazoned with the Red Cross emblem. According to one worker, the assistance was for people who have suffered from the terrible consequences of shelling on the city. Society. This has been put in their warehouse for further allocation to the people in need. Those for uh, who took. We distributed 60 tons of food and non-food items for the people who have suffered from the terrible consequences of the shelling on this city. Um, this uh, help uh, humanitarian assistance will be distributed by the Ukrainian Red Cross Society. This has been put in their warehouse for further allocation to the people in need. Those for uh, who took, for instance, take shelter in the uh, metro station of Kharkiv. Uh, we hope to continue this distribution assistance through them for the benefit of the civilians who are in need of uh, uh, assistance uh, from all possible uh, nature, and the DICRC is there to support them. In the meantime, refugees from the port city of Odessa say they're afraid for their town as they flee the Russian invasion today. After more than four weeks of fighting, Russia has failed to seize any major Ukrainian city, and the conflict has reportedly killed thousands of people, sent nearly 3.8 million abroad, and driven more than half of Ukraine's children from their homes. People are afraid, but the people don't want to leave Odessa. And I'm very sorry that I have to leave because I'm not very good to health. I'm very proud of my city, of my country. It's very difficult because we don't have food enough, we don't have medicine, and especially if you have diabetes, for example, you don't have any medicines at all. Um, so they block the city, all the ways out of the city and in the city. So they do not enter any buses or maybe humanitarian you know, trucks or something from Ukraine. Uh, they try to manipulate and show that they are giving us uh, help uh, from Russia, but it's not true. And uh, they are uh, capturing our activists, even our uh, ex-soldiers. We hate them. They are occupants. We don't like them. We don't want them in our land. They are terrorists. Putin is a terrorist. All Russian people who support Putin are terrorists. And all the soldiers in our country should leave, must leave, or must die. Now, some 139 Ukrainian orphans and their caretakers have been welcomed into the Turkish touristic province of Antalya just weeks after they fled the war and evacuated to Poland. According to the Ukrainian ambassador to Turkey, Vasily Bodna, up to 2,000 children could be brought to Turkey in the coming weeks. UNICEF says more than 10 million Ukrainians have fled the war, half of them children, with the largest refugee inflows into Poland, Romania, Moldova and Hungary. We have more coming up after the break on the program. As global efforts continue to bring Russia to its knees and stop the war in Ukraine, is President Vladimir Putin a war criminal? That's a question of morality in the war. Stay with us.
Welcome back. We left off uh, before the break talking about Turkey expecting more Ukrainian children in the coming weeks. And Poland, which has received the highest number of refugees from Ukraine so far, says it will continue to accept them. Polish authorities say the country has seen over 2.2 million Ukrainian refugees crossing into its border since the conflict began. Charity organizations on the Polish side have been giving out free food and water to fleeing Ukrainians. Ukrainian refugees in Poland are granted 18-month visas which gives them access to many social welfare services. As men of conscription age from 18 to 60 are not allowed to leave Ukraine, women and children uh, and uh, the refugees fleeing into Poland must now find a way to put food on the table. That notwithstanding, spokesperson for Poland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Lukas Jasina, says Poland will keep receiving refugees and in an even more organized way. First, we still continue to uh, accept refugees. Now uh, we hope, uh, with better help from our European allies, uh, to try to organize more uh, mutual helpful projects. Uh, second, the Polish state is changing this acceptation of the refugees into more organized, state organized. Next week, Polish Prime Minister will present a program how to deal with, in next few years, with Russian gas, oil, and call inside the European Union and change uh, this call, for example, for a call from Australia or change that oil and gas facilities for, for the other directions. French President Emmanuel Macron has been warning against a verbal escalation of the war in Ukraine. He gave the warning a day after U.S. President Joe Biden described President Vladimir Putin as a butcher and that he should not be allowed to remain in power. President Macron also told French media that the goal is for a ceasefire in Ukraine and then the withdrawal of troops, of Russian troops. He says this will not be possible with an escalation through words or actions. U.S. authorities have already denied President Biden was calling for regime change in Russia. Macron's, Macron has maintained communication with uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin throughout the war and says he will speak with other presidents in the next two days to organize the evacuation of civilians from the heavily bombarded port city of Mariupol. And more on that now, as France's Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian says that there would be collective guilt if nothing is done to help civilians in Mariupol. He was addressing the Doha Forum International Conference where he said Mariupol is one of the most striking examples of military seizures. Uh, horrible because civil populations are massacred and annihilated. He says the suffering is terrible that's why there needs to be at least one moment when the civilian population can breathe. Well, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Israel, where he and Prime Minister Naftali Bennett have been holding talks. Mr. Bennett has urged the U.S. Uh, to heed calls against any removal of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps from the U.S. terrorism blacklist. It came during the joint statement by both leaders who started... Uh, for, and for Mr. Blinken, who started his trip to the Middle East today, where he will take part in a rare Arab-Israeli summit and hold talks with regional partners on stalled Iranian nuclear talks and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The UAE. The Middle East is changing, and it's changing for the better. We're cultivating old ties and building new bridges. We're rejuvenating old peace and charging it with the new energy of the Abraham Accords. We're working together to overcome the old forces of darkness and build a new future that's better, brighter, and promising. And unfortunately, there are other forces in the region that are still violent and destructive. As I uh, just shared with you in the meeting, we're concerned about the intention to delist the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. We also share, and we are united in addressing the challenges posed by Iran, including its nuclear program. And there is no daylight between us on the fundamental proposition that Iran must never be allowed to acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, and whether there is a return to the JCPOA, the Iran Nuclear Agreement, or not, that principle will not change, nor will our commitment to it. Israel stands firm with the people of Ukraine and is going to continue our effort to help reduce the suffering and end the bloodshed. And of course, we're doing what we can when asked 
to contribute to the efforts to end this war. We do this while maintaining close coordination with the United States and with our European partners. I thank the Prime Minister for his diplomatic efforts, important diplomatic efforts, uh, to end Rus the Russian government's aggression uh, against uh, Ukraine. We value uh, these efforts, uh, and uh, we've been closely coordinated uh, throughout. Uh, it's important, and your insights as well uh, are very meaningful, so I thank you for them. The United States president considers his Russian counterpart a war criminal and a butcher and says it should not be in power for long. But even the United States and the West has been called out for its own interventions in wars across the globe where innocent civilians have been killed without anyone fighting for their justice. Professor of African Politics, African Development and International Relations at the University of Pretoria in South Africa, Professor Christopher C.K. You're watching Channels Television, reaching you live from Lagos, Nigeria. And that's all we can take on the Russian invasion on Ukraine. We now bring you the next program, Eagle Eye. Please join us. Friends and patriots, welcome and good evening to you. My name is Ajuri Ingalali, and I come to you from the nation's capital. The Disrespecting international law, international norms. Um, you mentioned uh, Iraq, you mentioned Syria. Um, these are examples, um, or, and, and, and many um, uh, critics uh, of, of the West have used um, uh, this whataboutism, you know, as um, uh, excuse for why Russia should, you know, be, uh, uh, you know, allowed to do what it is doing. But um, I think that it should go beyond that because um, if this this conflict, I've said elsewhere, um, provides um, a, a silver lining for um, the world and for Africa, especially, to push for um, a redefinition of of the international system. Um, one that will be more inclusive of, 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 of geographies like Africa um, and, you know, um, a world that will be more equitable um, and a push for a reform of the United Nations um, Security Council uh, where countries would not just, it, it will be um, for countries that are friends with one another uh, or countries that are there because of the power that they have. It should also um, recognize the uh, power of, of, of demographics, you know, so that um, um, countries like Nigeria, for example, should have very good reason why um, they should be part of that decision-making body, irrespective of what happens within um, um, Nigeria itself as a country. Mm -hmm. We've seen democracy also recede in the United States, from, from, for example. It, it has not stopped the United States from pushing for democracy, advancing democracy um, all over the world. So um, the fact that we have developmental problems does not mean that we cannot be, have a seat on the table um, on account of our population uh, in the world alone. And of course, our importance, our strategic importance extends beyond that. But we need to see this conflict as an opportunity to push for a more fair international system that is actually inclusive, that is truly international, in, in, in as the name implies. And, and a starting point would be, you know, getting, um, um, you know, different regions of the world a seat on the table on account of representativity, not just of, uh, you know, military power or economic power, um, and there are countries in the United Nations Security Council that are not even uh, superpowers uh, on, in any form, but they are in the United Nations Security Council. Uh, so, so those are some of the inequities in the global system that um, allow for this kind of uh, behavior, you know, by Russia, because it's been done before by the West. The West has tolerated it, and, and when Russia does it, it's legitimate when people say, but if the United States had done it, um, um, uh, Russia should be able to do it, even though the pushback is that, well, the United States is so superpower, Russia is not. So um, th these are, uh, you know, uh, contending views. But my, my own position is, is simply that we have an international system that is not fair, uh, that is racist, uh, that is inequitable. And we must, as, a, as, as, as an African uh, continent, come together and find ways to push for a redefinition of that world, either uh, from the ashes of this war or from the ashes of a, you know, um, a global world war, depending on what um, uh, happens going forward. 
Now, when you're talking about, you know, that international body, I suppose you're talking about the UN, you know, and reforms in the UN have been spoken about, you know, with each uh, uh, General Assembly. Um, the UN has a Security Council. There's a secluded group, of course, um, with Russia as a member. Can the UN make any effective impact on this war, uh, any effective resolution concerning the war in Ukraine with Russia being part of the Security Council? No, it can't. And, and that's why it couldn't deter Russia in the first place. It couldn't even get a vote to, to, to condemn um, uh, Russia's invasion of, of, of Ukraine uh, in the United Nations Security Council. It could only do that in the UN General Assembly. And, and, and this is what I'm talking about, uh, an international system that allows for a few countries, uh, for whatever reasons, to sit around the table and decide the fate of, of, of others, uh, uh, billions of people um, that are not represented. And, and, and this, is, this, is, this is based on the logic of, of, of being and non-being the racist being uh, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, categorization of the world into two zones of, of Europeans as beings who enjoy special privileges and non-Europeans, uh, including Africans, as non-beings, non-human beings, um, who are an afterthought, depending on the whims and purposes of the so-called beings. Um, until we have an international system where a human being, irrespective of your color or ethnicity, um, is a human being, and 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 you know, uh, you know, people are, are not grouped into two regions based on their race, but based on the fact that every human being is equal, and every human being deserves the enjoyment of of of, of rights and privileges that the world has to offer. That should be the logic, the 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 the, 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 the ontological basis of an international system uh, uh, that will be equitable, that will be fair, and it's on that basis we can begin to ask the question of who um, is, is, is going to have a seat at the table where, you know, the, the, the top table where, you know, decisions will be made concerning how the world would be run. Um, um, if some people take it as their right to decide for others, uh, irrespective of who you are, we are going to keep having this kind of problem, especially when um, um, the, 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 the situations like this and uh, then confront them with being judges in their own courts. Then the question will be, where is the fairness? Where is the equity? Uh, and this is the point, uh, really. The United Nations is, is crippled. It can do no more than um, pray and, and, and wish that Vladimir Putin changes his mind. And, and that's what you found the United Nations Security, uh, uh, the United Nations Secretary General uh, uh, do, uh, appealing, pleading um, with Russia, you know, to, uh, to for the sake of, of, of people uh, that are going to die from the conflict, not to go ahead with his... With his, with his aggression, it, it fell on deaf ears because, of course, uh, uh, Putin has, um, you know, a much more broader um, um, uh, strategy, uh, uh, purpose in, in terms of why he's doing what he's doing, which um, does not align with the moral, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, pleas of, 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 a, of, a, of a toothless United Nations uh, system. You can watch uh, the rest of the interview and more with uh, Professor Christopher Isike on Diplomatic Channel. He airs tomorrow, Monday, at 8.30 p.m. on Sky 518 in the UK and at 11.30 p.m. on DSTV. Let's get some more perspective on this now. Joining me is non-resident senior fellow in peace building and global economic policy at the Global Governance Institute in Brussels, Belgium, Ambassador Eloho. Otobo. He is also, he had previously served as director and deputy head of the UN Peacebuilding Office at the United Nations headquarters in New York, where he also acted as assistant secretary general, his author of two books, Consolidating Peace in Africa, the role of the United Nations Peacebuilding Commission and Africa in Transition, and a new way of looking at progress in the region. He was nominated for the Grand Prix of Literacy Associations Award in 2008 in the research category. His series titled China, America and Russia's Game of Influence in Africa was published by The Guardian in 2019 to 2020. Ambassador Otobo, thank you for joining me on the program today. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I want to start from, you know, where you have worked, which is the United Nations. And if you heard Professor Isike, uh, the UN has received some bashing as regards its role in trying to prevent Russia in this war. Where do you stand on this? 
No, well, I, I think Professor Zike touched some, the, the, some of the basic uh, flaws of, of the current arrangement. Because don't forget, in 2003, as America was getting ready to go to Iraq on the basis of what turned out to be false intelligence, there was pressure on America to wait for a time before uh, you could go. America went nonetheless. In fact, at that time, the French president broke with him because he said he needed more time to reflect on it. Quote was I. America went alone with only a few coalition of the willing. So as you said, the in inequities of the international system, especially as reflected in the representation of the Security Council and the veto power that is inherent in some of the, with the, with the permanent five, we always make it possible for it to be uh, a fair uh, and neutral restraint on the big powers. Yeah, but that uh, neutral position looks more of a crippled position to many watchers of international politics. How can the UN redeem its image? Well, when you talk of redeeming the image, there are, there are many levels. So let, let's, let's, let's look at the UN work in, in three baskets. The first is the area we're talking about, peace and security, which the UN plays a big role. Then there is the economic basket with all these network of uh, uh, regional economic commissions and uh, UNDP and uh, a variety of other development agencies. Then you have the humanitarian agencies. I think insofar as the humanitarian agencies are concerned and even the development agencies, they are doing a very good work because the standards they have set in those areas, whether you are talking of the SDG now and before that the MDGs, they have helped to propel initiative. The problem remains in the peace and security area. And as long as you have the veto arrangement in the Security Council, and as long as people can, those powers can ignore the wish of the international community, quite frankly, there is no immediate remedy in sight. Uh, they have, several options have been, have been discussed, one of which is to abolish the veto completely and give more power to the council. But then, of course, you cannot do that because those who are there now are not going to vote in favor of that. So we are now, we are confronted with a situation in which we have to try to make the best of what we have. And the best, the best what of what we have, as uh, Secretary General Guterres has said uh, recently, is that though the war is raging, it's going to end up in a negotiating table. And the earlier we move to the negotiating table to start sorting out some of these issues, the better. Because historically, most of the wars in the world have ended that way. Whether you talk of the uh, wars of uh, the religious war that lasted from 1618 to 1648, that led to the Westphalia Treaty, or you talk of the First World War that ended the Versailles uh, Treaty in Paris, or you talk of the Second World War that the Yalta Conference in South Crimea led to some resolution that was later codified in the UN. They have always ended in some negotiations, and therefore the encouragement for negotiation to move forward is the right direction. The problem now is getting Putin to the negotiating table, and I know that the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has said he is ready to negotiate with Russia, but it appears that you know the Russian government has its own agenda in Ukraine, and it's carrying out this so-called special military operation despite you know negotiations going on on the side. So where do you think Putin really stands and what he really wants out of this? Well, so that's a very interesting question. It is said that uh, in the past. 48 hours, the Russian government announced that they were going to, they had accomplished the first phase and they were now going to the second phase, which was generally interpreted to mean that they were now going to focus in the Donbass region where they have had their forces since, uh, since uh, uh, 2014. Now, but the question is that at the same time, there are reports breaking out as we speak uh, in the past few hours that they have also uh, sent some rockets or landed some records in, in the western part. So my feeling is that if the Ukrainians continue to hold the grounds they are doing around uh, uh, around uh, Kiev, the capital, and continue to recover some of the areas and stand their ground in areas like Odessa uh, and the related regions around that area, maybe that will force the negotiations that we're talking about. Because usually negotiations become attractive in a situation of stalemate. And the level you achieve stalemate is when the two powers now find themselves in a position where the other is not uh, having a, a superior hand. And the, the, the hope and expectation is that either that or a greater pressure by friends of Russia on the leadership will begin to make them realize the need to undertake negotiations. 
I'm still wondering, you know, what impacts those friends of Russia might have. But a uh, Ukrainian military intelligence uh, chief has warned that Russia is trying to apply, you know, what he calls the Korean scenario to, to Ukraine uh, after failing to take the capital and to depose the government. You know what happened eventually to uh, Korea? It was divided into two parts with the DMZ um, existing. And, you know, both sides have approached, you know, international politics and international relations uh, differently. Do you think that this is a possibility for Ukraine? It is, it is a distinct possibility. One cannot rule it out. And in fact, as the war has progressed, uh, and people, and the more you look at the map, the, 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 Denapia, the Denapia River divides that country almost equally, the eastern part, uh, where you, in fact, incidentally, the capital Kiev is, and the western part. Uh, so up till now, that, that fear is still there, that in fact, all this might be an effort to distract and cover, cover up the place in Tutu. The problem with that, of course, is that uh, they will have to then reoccupy Kiev because Kiev is in the eastern part, which they, which they want to put on their, their subjugation and occupation. Then uh, they will have to find a way of then giving up some of the areas there. Because as you may know, Odessa is actually in the eastern part. So whereas that is there, what will be interesting to see is how the Russian government is able to uh, have that eventuate. It's going to be problematic. And, and as I said, some, some sort of negotiations will come to play. But if, in fact, that is their plan, because these are based on intelligence report, if, in fact, that is their plan to divide the country, then, of course, the war might, have to, might last a longer time than we all expect. Would you consider President Putin a war criminal or a butcher, as the U.S. president has described him? Well, you see, the, this, is not, this is not something that, one person can decide to call another leader a war criminal. But we have historical precedent that stretches back to, to the Nuremberg trial, then, of course, most recently to the Yugoslav trials, and then the, the, the trials in Rwanda, then, of course, uh, Babo recently. Those are decisions that will have to be made by an internationally accredited, internationally uh, formed uh, tribunal that will come to ju judgment. And it's on the basis of when they come to that trial, come to that judgment, that's a, any, any punishment can be meted. But one cannot just label someone as a criminal. Uh, in fact, everyone is supposed to be presumed innocent uh, until proven guilty, even though we see that a lot of civilians have been killed, have been shelled. Uh, there, will be have, there will have to be a trial process for that uh, judgment to be made. Unfortunately, so me... as it may say. Okay, so how do you think this is going to end? Uh, countries have already taken, and I believe this is Ukraine, that's taken uh, Russia, uh, the Russian president, and even Russia, to the ICC um, to face charges of war crimes, you know, and crimes against humanity and whatever. Um, how do you think this will end, considering Russia is not signatory to the ICC? Neither is the United States, which is backing Ukraine, a member of the ICC. How do you think this will turn out in the end? Well, unfortunately, as you may know, the United States itself is not a signatory to the ICC. So in some ways, we do not stand on a very firm ground. The second point to note is that as a big power, Russia is not going to easily surrender in any, any of its uh, state, any of uh, its uh, leader. Don't forget there was a time that there was a court in Brussels that issued a warrant on the uh, Secretary of Defense, Rumsfeld, who has now, who died recently at uh, the age of 88. Of course, the, the both diplomatic and political pressures were brought in to make sure that that order of the court was never executed, although it frightened, uh, it raised the possibility that Rumsfeld could in fact be grabbed one day on a trip to Europe and the rest. And as you know, Brussels is center of European diplomacy and this order was issued by the court. So I do not, it would be very difficult on the basis of existing international practice and precedent for Russian government, even a new one, to send their leader to ICC. I mean, just, just to see how difficult it will be, see what has happened in Sudan. The pressures have been brought on Sudan, which is nowhere as rich or as powerful, as influential as uh, Russia. And they have uh, refused to send uh, Bashar to ISIS. So it's not something that uh, is going to come easily. Ambassador Eloha Tobo, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for joining me on the program this evening. It's my pleasure. Thank you. When we return after the break... Keeping hope alive as the Spanish choirs lead global sing-along for Ukraine.
welcome back our full one hour coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Today is day 32. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has been praising troops of the National Guard, marking its anniversary for the part that they have played in the special military operation in Donbass and in Ukraine. Our President Vladimir Putin, during a televised access access released on Sunday, which is today, separately addressed the servicemen of the National Guard, praising them for what he terms their utmost courage and professionalism, skillfully and resolutely and fearlessly showing personal heroism, com com competently and accurately achieving all the difficult tasks that he set. Russia sent tens of thousands of troops into Ukraine on February 24 in what he called a special operation to degrade its southern neighbor's military capabilities and root out people they called dangerous nationalists. But Ukrainian forces have mounted stiff resistance, and the West has imposed sanctions on Russia in an effort to force it to withdraw its forces. Well, Qatar's Minister of State for Energy Affairs says no one can immediately replace Russia's position in energy supply in Europe, and Qatar cannot provide immediate energy support for Europe. Saad Sharida al kabi said this at the ongoing 20th Doha Forum that Russia provided about 30 to 40 percent of Europe's natural gas needs, which cannot be replaced overnight. The European Union and the United States announced on Energy Cooperation Plan on Friday announced that they would expand the export of liquefied natural gas from the United States to Europe. The European Commission said in a statement on the same day that the cooperation plan will help the EU market obtain at least 15 billion cubic meters of liquefied natural gas this year. Well, speaking on the matter, al Kabi said that although Qatar is part of this cooperation plan, such a huge energy transmission cannot be done within sh a short period. He says it may take seven years to achieve this goal, and the help from other energy suppliers will be needed. Ukraine's military has gone from a discrepant state to becoming effective at fending off Russian advances in major Ukrainian cities. That's according to a retired U.S. military colonel who helped train and reform Ukraine's military following Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014. He served as a retired Army General John Abizet's executive officer for his Secretary of Defense appointment as a senior defense advisor to Ukraine in 2016 at the end of the Obama administration uh, when he was called to help reform the Ukrainian uh, defense establishment, according to uh, some publications. But Collins recently wrote a column in the publication titled, In 2014, the decrepit the de Ukrainian army hit the refresh button. Eight years later, it's paying off. He opens up about writing that Ukrainian general Viktor Mozenko described Ukraine's military in 2014 as decrepit. Yeah, I mean, Ukraine's military in 2014 was decrepit. It, it really didn't have a lot of training capability. They weren't effective at the tactical level. And so um, that's why they performed so poorly at the beginning of the war in the Donbass in the east with the Russians-led separatists when they were um, trying to, you know, secede from, from Ukraine in the East. And, and so it wasn't a surprise to see how poorly they performed at that time, given their level of training. I think without a doubt, anybody that has been over there and helping the Ukrainians train, I, I mean, everybody said, hey, these, they're different. They're, it's not the same as training Afghan army or the Iraqi army. Uh, they're going to fight for their nation. They're fight, you know, they're going to fight a, a extremely, right, overwhelming combat power but at the tactical level, they're going to outperform them, right? So that's what the challenge is, right? Facing this overwhelming combat power, but at that small unit level, they're going to beat them nine times out of 10 because they're better trained, um, better culture. Um, they empower junior leaders to, to have kind of take initiative on the battlefield, and that's going to win out at the tactical fights, and that's how we're seeing it playing, right? It allows them to take initiative on the battlefield, right? You might be given some you know, orders, go take this hill, for example, and if you can't just off that, right, you're just going to keep running up the hill into the into the hornet's nest, right, or into the machine gun fire, as opposed to deciding, hey, there might be a better way to accomplish this objective without actually going straight up the hill. And they learned that through eight years of fighting in Donbass in the east, that the speed of warfare in the 21st century is just too fast. You have to empower leaders to make those kind of quick decisions. But it also requires a trained professional military to do that. So, right, if you have a conscript army, which a, a lot of the Russians are, you're not going to be capable of, of executing that same kind of discipline initiative at the tactical level. I mean, it, it appears that they are still 
more regimented than they claimed to have, or the reforms people thought they might have made following 2008. I mean, they learned from their experience in Georgia in 2008, uh, saw a lot of shortcomings that they had, and they implemented a lot of those to perfection in 2014. I mean, one thing that they did very well in 2008 when they invaded Georgia and again in 2014 when they did their illegal annexation of Crimea was effectively leverage right cyber capabilities, electronic warfare, uh, conduct cyber attacks to, you know, as a start of the troops going across the border, electronic warfare to sever communications between the capitals and the command and control nodes and the units in the field to paralyze them. And that just hasn't played out in, in, in this, right? The, the Ukrainians have caught up and have, have figured out how to counter those measures. Uh, and, and so Russia really has not been able to perform at the same level. Right. So in, in 2016, we came on the mission. It was right at the tail end of Obama's administration. And I think a lot of people, regardless of what administration, whether they were, uh, you know, Democrat or Republican, you know, we had a lot of you know support or, or non-support from Congress uh, that really didn't, you know, the kind of in terms of didn't really go along strict party lines like foreign policy often doesn't. Um, but at that time, it was the, the Obama administration had a concept of no lethal aid to Ukrainians. And so it limited what kind of support you could give them, right? You couldn't give them Javelin anti-tank weapon systems, something that they really needed. And that did change under Trump. So Trump did approve the, the Javelin anti-tank weapon systems in, in late 2017. And those have been extremely effective uh, in, in, the, in this war in, uh, in 2022. And if you think about it, right, a lot of Baltic nations, right, transferred some of those weapon systems to them once it became obvious that you're listening to is uh, choirs in towns and cities across Spain today gathering to lead a global live streamed sing-along to support peace in Ukraine. That event organized by the Spanish organization Choirs for Peace saw over a thousand local choirs in countries including Spain, Portugal, the UK, Italy and Mexico sing in unison. It was streamed on YouTube. That's the program today. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Uvani.